It gives me immense pleasure in inviting Kanak once again to Aramal. Kanak is a great friend of Aramal and Aramal and another institution in Kataka to Mother Prasad work together and this relationship is it's a theme for South Asian students. When we started Yuma South Asian, that was around the same time we also took, I was also part of another startup. It was called Outlook Magazine. Outlook and Yuma started around the same time, uh, two months between each of them. The difference is Outlook had a corporate party. It was owned by the Asians. Whereas Himalaya won the intellectual battle. We are the scholars of South Asian origin across India and elsewhere coming together to create this platform where we can address our pressing issues. And one of the key aspects of addressing that issue was creation of this map. I always consider creation of this map as a very, very defining one because it did a simple inversion. All it did is make the map with south side up. The moment you have a orthograph to imagine a different direction now. In fact, we all are correct that we should do a map with west and the top east and the top. Connects and you is need to do it and if I am willing to fund it. But I could never make the money because that remains a nightmare. Map is how much are we trapped into a cartographic imagination of a nation state? And this cartographic imagination also brings in certain amount of rigid nationalism. To confront this rigid nationalism, we need all sorts of visual tools and cues to overcome that. But this idea of this entire map, which has been done to scale with just one shift, a directional shift. And this directional shift becomes so important because our politics itself has become a directional politics. And the directionally, we have a garrison imagination. The way you have your northwest frontier region, you have your northeast frontier region, and the moment you call them as northeast or northwest frontier, you are permitted to convert it into a garrison area. And by you are able to convert it into a garrison area without any sense of remorse because they are seen so distant. So with the very idea of the directional politics and what it brought to South Asia gets exemplified in this map. There will be an editor's note at the top where he actually explains why they did this map. But for me, that note should not have been in that size. It should have been in a bigger font because that actually deals with the problems what we are facing as South Asians. Way back in uh, the height of Indian nationalism, we had somebody like Rabindana Tagore writing this wonderful essay called Nationalism. He says, nationalism which is debilitating and which is giving a false sense of masculinity is not going to be of any help. And that essay on nationalism remains one of the most finest critique of an inclusive plural society. And remember, a person who questions nationalism, his work becomes the national anthem. If you are going to ignore the national anthem from somebody who has a critical idea of what is nation, how come we have lost that ability to question the people in public? Therefore, for me, Kanak's journey is a very, very important one because he had been questioning people in power throughout. And questioning people in power also means sometimes going against the popular grain. For instance, when the royal massacre happened in Nepal, 
Connect very clearly said in the royal massacre, his mother had nothing to do with it. A person who has been critical of royalty had absolutely no problem in making this fundamental mistake, uh, distinction. Yes, we are critical of royalty trying to take over and meddle with our democracy. But in this massacre, they have nothing to do with it. That he said it very, very clearly. And later with the royal coup happened. After the royal massacre, it was followed by the royal coup. At that time also, he opposed a royal coup, but he did not use a royal coup as a convenient excuse to shift the blame onto the royalty for an issue which did not happen. So for me, that becomes a very, very central one because he avoided easy temptations to log on charges on certain people because that was a fashionable thing to do. And he never did anything which was fashionable. And Interestingly, he tried to do something which is so unfashionable, which is actually making Indian and Pakistani editors talk. I had an opportunity of hosting nine of these conferences where we had connect to be the moderator and we are so happy because having a journalist from Nepal to be the moderator helped the Indians and Pakistanis to overcome their own national stake Blinkers. And Kanak easily lifted the veil out of this and he helped people to talk to each other. And talking to each other is a first step in understanding our region. And I'm so happy that Kanak had agreed to come and share his thoughts with us. May I request Kanak to come to the stage, please? And we to Kanak. By the by, the subject himself, because so much happens in the life of a journalist that you keep moving ahead, uh, journalist and activist, I might add. So thank you, Paneer. Now that we have brought the, thank you for bringing it close up. I can tell you that some of the themes that I will uh, present in uh, in. Uh, what I have to say here. One is Himal as what uh, salvation. Salvation as one word. I will not proceed to explain it, but I hope by the end of my presentation you will understand why South Asia is written here as one word. Secondly, here we are in Chennai. Normally when you have a map and you could do a close-up of a title, Chennai falls off the screen, as you will know. Well, here, this is an interesting juxtaposition of the top of the page and Chennai there. That's because we are um, we are taught to think of North as top of page. And uh, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, south of the Vendias tend to be south of South Asia, south of India. So you you find it in the bottom, but here it's on top. The explanation is here. This map of South Asia may seem upside down to some, but that is because we are programmed to think of North as top of page. This rotation is an attempt by the editors of Himal South Asian magazine to reconceptualize regionalism in a way that the focus is on the people rather than the nation states. This requires nothing less than turning our minds downside up. Now, the rest of my presentation will essentially be an attempt to elucidate or expand upon that, that last line there, uh, proposing that South Asian regionalism and the idea of South Asia is not a romantic notion. It is not uh, something that makes one feel good. Instead, it is a necessity for a region that hosts more than 24%, nearly a fourth of the world's population. And we are locked into nation states that are centralized, that are not 
devolved in terms of power that do not do justice to the genius of individual citizens. But it is not talked about in the seminar halls, the idea of South Asia. It is not debated. It is set aside because it's an inconvenient subject. Talking about South Asia tends to make scholars a little uneasy because every country of South Asia is a centralized nation state. And uh, to propose some other way of looking at the region in a way questions the very didactic notions of the nation states, especially the notions held by the capital elites. And so, when you start proposing South Asia as a concept, it becomes immediately targeted. And in these days of heightened hyper-nationalism, somebody who talks about South Asia, including a scholar, might be considered anti-national. And that is enough for the trolls. And that is enough to keep scholars from stepping away, from evaluating the idea of South Asia in terms of how it may be useful to consider a future of this subcontinent. And that is where I come in, in the sense that I am not a scholar. If anything, I'm a journalist and a bit of an activist. But through two decades of editing Himal magazine, a South Asian magazine, I have come to my personal conclusion that this is a topic that is important. And it is important even though it is not talked about. And I already more or less explained why the concept of South Asia is not talked about. Uh, and there is an incongruity. We are a fourth of the world's population. We are divided by nation-state boundaries. We are becoming ever more shrill in our nationalism. While we forget the needs of social and economic advance of the people. Yet, the scholars are silent on considering this aspect. We have scholars who talk about local government. They go deep into it. L scholars who look into um, cooperatives as a mode of economic governance. They look at um, capitalist systems. They look at uh, provincialism, devolution of power within states. All of that is allowed. But the moment you want to look at South Asia as a whole and come up with solutions that binds all these regions and the solution may, would be maybe something different from what I offer, for example, as I will refer to, but that is a taboo area. And so a plea I have, uh, I would have for scholars from all parts of South Asia, including India and in, including especially south of India where we are right now, is to begin serious study of the idea of South Asian regionalism, which is a neglected area. So with that, let me get into my presentation proper. I should take about half an hour, I hope, um, maybe a little longer. But um, I'll start with two anecdotes to shake you up just a bit. Um, some anecdotal information. So I would start by referring to the Mahatma Gandhi as a South Asian. And you would ask, how come? And I would re respond, the Mahatma died when he was 78. Uh, he was no more than five and a half months into the nation state of India. What that means is that before he was killed by the hands of a, and the bullets of an assassin, uh, he was part of what you would call undivided India. Undivided India makes up what today, most of what you would call South Asia. So if 
the mahatma was not was a citizen of undivided india after india got divided that's when he became a citizen of india so yes you can call him indian in a diffuse sense but when you say mahatma was an indian there are two aspects to his indianism one is pre august 1947 one is post august 1947 15th august the date of his departure i could be wrong with the exact date jan yes august is the day of independence january so five and a half months was all that he was an indian citizen of modern day india other than that he was a citizen of undivided india and in today's parlance because the term india has been taken over by a nation state and even that is now in debate vis-a-vis -vis bharat and india but nevertheless undivided india became divided into india and pakistan and sri lanka and later pakistan became bangladesh and uh, pakistan proper so that's one anecdote to to chew into a bit the other is paneer referred to the national anthem of india which was penned by the bard in 1911 and if you go into it it actually is if anything an anthem for the larger south asia because it was written in during the time of undivided india and so you have there the reference to punjab but that punjab is not punjab with state with the capital of amritsar it is undivided punjab in 1911 there is a reference to banga meaning bengal that is not bengal meaning west bengal as the citizens of india would look at it today it is bengal as a entity that includes present day bangladesh so and then you have even more incongruous you've got sindh in there so sindh is a province of pakistan it doesn't even have a part that is presently within the states of india so what we are talking about is that we have already been living a south asian life life without knowing it the national india anthem of india itself acknowledges that there where there was a historic city that was broader than the nation state of india and so if we have accepted that much knowingly and unknowingly then it might not be that tough that difficult to understand the need to conceptualize south asia as a new entrant to the discourse uh, when the focus is mostly about talking about nation state politics nation state geopolitics how do we for example consider south asian civilization vis-a-vis the chinese civilization we because india is so much because india incorporates such a large part of south asia which includes pakistan bangladesh nepal bhutan afghanistan sri lanka we tend to indians the citizens of india tend not to consider that they do not encompass the indian civilization as it comes down through the ages it is a large part of that civilization but a part of that civilization it does not include everything it certainly does not include to take an example the the indus valley civilization much, much of it because that happens to be present in present day pakistan so if you look at south asia if you want to compare south asia or undivided india with another area that is china and think about ways of interaction between these two regions it doesn't do to think of only india vis-a-vis -vis china vis-a-vis -vis. i do not mean in competition but just to compare and contrast south asia makes better sense if you want to look at the civilizational region of present day china and the civilizational historicity of india where does the term south asia come and why do we are we forced to use it because it is certainly not a home grown term 
by that sense neither is india a homegrown term nor is what who we would call hindu a homegrown term it is a terminology of others looking at us and us incorporating that as our own likewise south asia is a term devised right after 1947 in the early 50s by strategic thinkers and analysts of the west because when they look at looked at south asia when they looked at the subcontinent they could never say india if they meant the whole region they could not certainly say if they were talking about pakistan before pakistan was created in 47 it was part of undivided india but the moment you have to say where is pakistan you cannot say oh, pakistan is in india because india the name the nomenclature has been taken by a nation state and so you have to use another term and that term the easiest one is a geographical term a neutral geographical term which is south asia the reason i belabor this point is because i find because as i said earlier india is so much of south asia geographically in terms of size of population in terms of the variety and diversity india also is right in the middle of it all so indians haven't really have had to mull indian citizens have never had to really mull over the idea of south asia because they're quite content to be the inheritors of the nomenclature of ancient india but when you are presented with a problem what do you call where is pakistan you can't say oh pakistan is in india that it have worked before 1947 not thereafter so oh pakistan is in either you say the indian subcontinent which also has india within it so average pakistani might not like using it because they are also now already divided into a different country or you might say the subcontinent alone without the indian add on but then that could be very there's that could be anywhere in the globe and hence south asia became the terminology to use it gathered steam till such time that when the idea of regionalism particularly after the experiment of asean and the experiment with uh, uh, north american regionalism then came european union and so the countries of south asia also became a little romanticized by the thought of regionalism and they decided to accept the term south asia incorporate it accept it each nation state each president and prime minister to create the sark organization south asian association for regional cooperation so to that extent south asia is accepted by our state establishments but that is not good enough is what i propose that we need to ration, rationalize we need to conceptualize south asia better than to just use it as a nomenclature when you have to refer to this region as a whole and and for it to mean nothing else is a waste we have to have south asian regionalism to mean something if we now accept that the term is with us to stay now let's talk about the term just a bit what else could have been the title the name for this region when we are using south asia well um you could call it the subcontinent i have suggested to you while that is not absolutely appropriate or useful you could call it gondwana for the prehistoric region uh you could call it bharat but the people who want to call it bharat have a rather restricted view of who they mean to be the inhabitants of bharat and the historicity of bharat a separate vision or you could think about um, jambu dweep but jambu dweep is a region that is income passes more than the subcontinent you could call it hindustan but hindustan mostly tends to refer to the northern hindi urdu speaking belt rather than all of the subcontinent so you can also call it akhand akhand bharat uh 
for those of the ilk who would want to see a religion uh, having continuity exclusive of others. Uh, and therefore, this all of this can be, well, it can be used as a theoretical or a historical or a mythological term, but it does not work in this day and age when the region is already cut up and divided into nation states because there will have to be buy-in by everyone. And I should also mention the idea of South Asia should not or need not be threatening to the nation states amongst us. Let the nation states prosper. But let us find a way in which there is a way to interconnect better now. I have already suggested to you why the scholarship for this interconnection, interconnection is lacking. And there is even more awareness among scholars to talk about and to rationalize South Asia as a term because of the fear of the ultra-nationalist trolls, not just in, in uh, India, also in Pakistan. The moment the idea of South Asia becomes real, a little of a challenge, then I think we, we, can, we can be prepared for more negativism about the term. For, for a long time, the idea of South Asia has remained on a shelf for people like me to talk about, not threatening existing capital elites or establishments in each of the countries. I propose to you that the moment we start studying it more in detail and when people start considering it as a viable way to move ahead as a concept, then there will be a backlash. And that backlash may not be very harsh, will indicate that there is some, the idea is gaining some traction. Thus far, I have to confess, as also one of the criers in the wilderness. South Asia as a term does not threaten enough. Why? And the reason is not uh, a very heartening. South Asia as a, as a concept does not threaten because each nation states, each capital is very comfortable with its managing its own nation states, becoming increasingly autocratic and taking economic advantage of being the elite, using the army to your purpose, using the bureaucracy and the judiciary to your purpose, and ruling the roost from the capital. And so, you have South Asia as a term, for now, not threatening to anybody in Islamabad, anyone in New Delhi, anyone in Kathmandu, Dhaka, or Colombo. We want to have the kind of scholarship that would make the idea mildly threatening. Making sure, as I suggested to you earlier, there is no reason to do away with the nation state. Let them do good for the people. But that there be conceptualization of the idea of South Asia in a way that it will serve the people of South Asia. And if it doesn't work, let it go. But at least study it. The just justification. So, having said this much, I will have to come up with the justification for or the rationale for South Asia. As I told you earlier, I do not consider it to be a romantic notion, that it has uses. So, what are the uses? Firstly, South Asia is the inheritor of the idea of undivided India, plus a few other parts of undivided. Uh, of this region that were not colonized under the British, such as Nepal, or you could say Bhutan, or Afghanistan. But if you bring all of this in together, then what is it, why does it make sense? Firstly, there is something to be said for the inclusivity of a shared history. A shared history is why the smell of a particular spice in the marketplace will pull a South Asian nostril, whether you are in the Anarkali market in, uh, uh, in Lahore or in a market in old part of Chennai or Dhaka 
or Kathmandu. The history that brings you together in terms of innumerable interconnections is one reason that people feel a warmth of being par having a kind of an identity, which right now is fractured because Pakistan's intellectuals, many intellectuals in Pakistan are rushing to create their own history of Pakistan as if there were no India or the rest of South Asia. We find the same thing happening in India. We find a kind of a ultra-nationalist history also propagated in Bangladesh and in Nepal and in Sri Lanka. So, the history of South Asia as a whole has to be considered as different from the histories being manufactured in each, con in each country, in each capital, which is exclusivist. We need to sense that, feel that inclusion, a cultural inclusion that comes from a shared history. So that is a no-brainer. It's a good idea because South Asia as a term is inherited to ancient India, the civilization. You got to go beyond that and you look at social issues. So many social issues bind South Asians together. For example, the spread of vectors. Take the COVID epidemic. How much would South Asia have benefited if there were cross-border collaborations? How much would they be benefits if malaria were studied across borders? Or the burgeoning modern day diseases. There's none of that or almost none of that happening. If there is any collaboration, it is with the entity outside of South Asia, which then collaborates with the neighboring country. So there's enormous loss of social interaction for the sake of the people. Like if you look at the experience, sadly now weakened, of India's experience of freedom of information. The freedom for, to get information from the state as a right by the citizen. That is something that is required in Bangladesh and in Pakistan and Sri Lanka and Nepal. And starting from Rajasthan, that is where there was an advance in India. But the nation state boundaries meant that that sharing did not happen. If you look at community forestry in Nepal, so much sharing could happen all the way to Chitral, all the way down to the hills of Sri Lanka, central Sri Lanka, didn't happen because of nation-state boundaries. So we're missing a lot there. We're also missing a lot in cultural profusion that is happening in parts of South Asia. Everything is overcome by highly commercialized uh, productions. If you look at Bollywood, for example. Bollywood is providing us kind of a oneness. It's like McDonald McDonaldization of culture in South Asia. If you look at the way Bollywood has propagated marriage ceremonies in Kathmandu, the kind of new rituals that never existed in the past. Why is that happening? Because of an, if you will call it the the spread of highly commercialized and hence powerful money-making machines, which means that other parts of South Asia do not get to project their own sense of self. If there were loosening of borders, there would be more give and take. So even Bollywood may be become more inclusive in its projections. But finally, the most important rationale for a South Asian concept and a implementation of such a concept, which may take different forms, is the economic. The economies of South Asia are not rationalized because suddenly one fine day, Partition happened. I talk of most of colonized South Asia. And then other parts of South Asia, such as Nepal, were not formally colonized, but certainly under the colonial uh, umbrella. What you've got is the inability to 
reach the hinterland for your production, for your factories. Best example is to use the example of uh, cotton, cotton production and ginning mills. Present day India, present day Pakistan. And you go beyond that to all kinds of production and then reaching to the markets. Uh, this is where the people of South Asia would benefit incredibly if their customs duties were reduced, if the cross-border access to raw materials were easier, uh, rather than try to create vertical economic structures in each country, there would be more prosperity all around. Also, with trade and third country trade and not just bilateral trade. But I would suggest to you that one reason the countries of South Asia don't really bother with economic rationalization and the importance of South Asia in it is because the capitals do not really bother about the periphery states. So New Delhi, for example, doesn't really bother about the poverty in northern Bihar vis-a-vis -vis its own sense of self and grandeur. The Islamabad state does not really care for more interaction across the border, economic and community-wise. So, but then, if it is such an important topic, why are the economists not writing papers and articles uh, in mainstream media, writing papers for economic journals? Because by now they've felt that they will be making proposals, A, that they will be lambasted for, for the reasons I suggested to you earlier. Secondly, they feel that there is such a distance now from the idea of regionalism that every nation state has gone so far ahead now forgetting what are the possibilities of regionalism in all of 70 years that it's not, there is no hope to rebuild those kinds of economic, social, cultural re relationships. And so, I believe that the scholars have sort of given up to propose ideas that will lead South Asia to one vision of how we may evolve in future with the nation states, but with softer borders, with easy people-to-people -people movement. There's the demonization of India in Pakistan and demonization of Pakistan in India. As if, as if the states represented the people. When we have to talk about people-to-people -people relationships, we are reminded again and again that actually they are one and the same. And so, the violence with which uh, so much of the media in Pakistan refers to India and vice versa does not reflect the actual need for the people-to-people the, the fact that the people-to-people -people relationship would be much more pleasanter than that. So, the point I'm making is the scholarship is not doing its job. And if they would want to feel that the time is passed for conceptualizing a South Asian future, then I would say that is chickening out. And the plea I would make, and I'll come, I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. The plea I would make is for scholars to gird up their loins, so to speak, to look at this area as an untrodden area for scholarship, where the NGOs are not interested anymore because there is not enough funding. And the governments are now at an extreme, um, especially since SARC has become moribund um, as of now. Uh, the scholars feeling that this is not the area that they will get funding and uh, published and then not to get uh, hit at for publishing a South Asian idea. 
some scholars should override such uh, reluctance and come up with concepts and theories and proposals that will begin to roll back the tide on extreme ultranationalism by showing economic rationality, cultural uh, sense of togetherness and a sense of history. Because I am personally convinced there is no other way forward but for the nation states and the citizens of nation states of South Asia to work towards a common future where they are more linked than they are in the last 70 years. So, let me conclude by making two or three points. When people say, well, but South Asia is a, such an alien term, it's in English. Well, who's asking you to speak only in English? You can speak the South Asia as an idea will be, become more powerful when it is discussed and debated in the vernacular, if that is the right term, in the languages. Such as, if you have Hindi publications talking about the idea of South Asia as Dakshin Asia, that is when you get traction among the public. But it all starts with the scholarship, mind you. When the scholarship gets interested, that forms the base for the journalist to get interested, the opinion maker to get in interested, the influencer to get started on this. If you want to speak in Urdu in Pakistan, you can say Junubi Asia. So, South Asia as a term does not, we don't need to get stuck up in, in the idea of South Asia. There will be terms in Tamil, there will be terms in Telugu, there will be terms in uh, Malayalam, not a problem. So, but in fact, the reason to uh, try and get the idea of South Asia discussed and considered in the languages of South Asia, in Sindhi, in Nepali, in Bangla, in Sinhala, is because that way it makes it more political. We need to make the idea of South Asia political. And where can we start? And since I happen to be in Chennai, as we speak, let me say that um, the further you get away from any capital, but not only, it is not only to be further away, but to be a cosmopolitan urban center also of learning. That is where the ideas of South Asia should be considered. Delhi is very satisfied to be the center of a powerful nation state as are the other nation states such uh, the capitals such as Islamabad or Kathmandu or Dhaka where is their intellectualism that may question the capture of the subcontinental imagination by Ultra nation statism, where it could be some large city of Pakistan away from Islamabad. It could be Karachi, it could be Lahore. I speak specifically of urban centers. Where could it be in this large nation state of India? It could be Bangalore, it could be Chennai, away from the capital. I believe that there is a responsibility to start scholars oh, far away from the capitals but confident scholars in their own urban milieus or perhaps non-urban milieus to start considering and conceptualizing and rationalizing the idea of South Asia and that is probably where I should end with this plea that if we need to consider the life of individual citizens of South Asia. For now, especially in the larger countries such as India and Pakistan, the sense of agency of a citizen is not fulfilled by being part of an undevolved, highly centralized 
nation state because you want to have a say in the running of your polity in large countries that is far away possibility so my own personal hypothesis is that the future of south asia should have the nation states as they exist but particularly within the larger nation states given that we have the provinces and the states more devolution there will ipso facto give you a south asia that we are looking for which will have more devolved power more localized power nobody is talking about a united states of south asia nobody is talking about a centralized capital of a region of south asia no the idea of south asia is a devolved south asia and who better to talk about devolution of power in within the individual nation states particularly the larger nation states than the urban centers that are far away from the capital and hence i suggest that cities such as bangalore and chennai start considering south asia as a here and now idea to discuss because delhi will not discuss it karachi should discuss it because islamabad will not discuss it so should lahore and i'll end now by trying to link sindh and tamil nadu because tamil nadu is where i am right now and uh, sindh is the province of pakistan that is uh, at a distance from islamabad and hence there may be a possibility of more openness to discuss the idea of south asia there is the idea that the south of india and the indus valley civilization are linked and there are historians and uh, others who study this in depth and they are making this what looks like a very viable idea of the ancient linkages from the northwest to the deep south that's priestly for you looking to the future when i was suggesting to you that the provinces and the states of india and pakistan have so much to mull over devolution of power there should also be some interaction between these places everything should not have to go through delhi and islamabad so i look forward to a day when the province of sindh and the state of tamil nadu may start interacting just because there are people there and there are people here intellectuals there and intellectuals here they may be able to come up with an idea good for each province and state but good for all of south asia because the capitals are not doing it and that is how i would propose to end my presentation to you thank you